Hi everyone, it's good to see you all again. It's been a little while since I've uh, produced a video. A lot of things have been happening. We uh, moved our office to Newport Beach, I moved my residence to Newport Beach. Uh, so a lot going on. I was asked to give a talk to the Asian Institute of Technology in Thailand about strengthening repair of existing structures and, and the use of external post-tensioning to do it. Uh, this was all before the Florida Surfside collapse and um, I don't have any more information than any of you do about that particular collapse, but it is likely that some of this uh, you know, might be relevant. So it turned out to be a more interesting talk. I think I had, they said over 250 people uh, watching in the uh, in the Asian communities around uh, Thailand, the best thing about it was I got to give that talk in Thailand from my chair in Newport Beach. The only downside was I had to do it at about eight o'clock at night so they could see it first thing in the morning. But I think it went well. So here was that talk. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Here's an external post-tensioning photo. You're going to see more of these, but this is the basic idea. We use post-tensioning outside of the structure to strengthen it. There's tremendous benefits, and that's what we're going to talk about during this talk. It's extremely effective in strengthening repairing structures because it can really be used for any material. Um, you're actually going to see that we use this in a, a wood structure, which um, I was young and foolish at the time, I guess. But uh, <laughs> I still get kind of get the willies uh, when I look at those. But um, can be used for anything. The, probably the best thing about it is you add tremendous strength without adding any weight to the system. Now that's a big deal because most of the time when we're retrofitting structures, we're adding a lot of weight to do it. We're adding concrete, we're adding beams, we're adding floor, you know, literally sometimes pouring a floor over another floor. So now you're looking at the columns and the foundations and the seismic system. Using external post-tensioning, you really don't have to worry about any of that because the system just effectively doesn't weigh anything. We can get both deflection control and additional strength using this. The external post tensioning is really just like a permanent jacking system. Connect columns, girders, and the interesting thing about that is the vertical component of the post tensioning literally can take load, vertical load, around the area that you're worried about, the affected area, the critical punching shear zone or shear zone sometimes and take it directly to the support. So uh, another great thing about post tensioning, another load path. Previous versions of ACI 318 did have a specific section that said external post tensioning. So if you go back in your old ACI codes, you can find that. Now it's a little bit scattered all over the code. But I really believe that's primarily because it's just well accepted now as a strengthening um, method. At, at first, it scared people a little bit, just like everything else in post-tensioning does. But then they get used to it and like it. <laughs> um, this is not the type of thing you want to do with the low bid contractor. This is something you want to go in with a specialty contractor who really understands post-tensioning and the forces involved and the dangers involved. We'll often do this design build. Um, again, don't use, <laughs> probably not a good idea to put this out to bid and take the lowest bid. So why use this? Well, a lot of times in, we get called because there's damage in a structure due to corrosion and exposure. Remember, I, I put this together before that surfside collapse um, but I think they're looking you know very closely at corrosion they were right on the ocean you know it just takes salt water and air to get into metal and it starts corroding it salt water a big problem you'll 
you'll see uh, snow. Snow is a problem because they put salt where there is snow to uh, melt the snow. So we're up in the mountains, up in the Lake Arrowhead area, and uh, lots of corrosion up there because of the de-icing salts put on the snow. Sometimes there's additional load that has come along over the years that wasn't accounted for in the original design. Uh, thinking of a project that we did out in Palm Springs where a landscaper decided to put a tremendous amount of soil, planters, uh, all kinds of additional things that weren't in the original design and you know of course soil being about one of the heaviest things you can put on a structure that one was suffering. Architects may want to repurpose a building, change the occupancy or use of the building. We're talking about older buildings. We are typically, you know, what I'm talking about today are buildings that are 30 to 40 years old, sometimes older. So you can scrap the building, you can tear it down, and a lot of times that is one of the options that they're looking at. Is it, does it make more sense to just tear this building down, or can we strengthen it and continue using it? Well, that's, that's where you come in. Change in live load comes with change in occupancy. Landscaping loads, topping slabs, those really seem to be more popular than they used to be these days. So, so you're called and, and somebody's concerned for some reason that a structure might be suffering due to corrosion. Well, concrete is terrific at communicating. Um, a lot more than, than my wife is. Uh, you know, I have to kind of read and read between the lines with what she's saying. With concrete, it will just pop off some concrete and say, hey, I'm suffering, here's where I'm suffering, and I want to show it to you. So here's concrete speaking to us saying, hey, I'm experiencing corrosion, I'm experiencing it right here, and I'm going to spall this concrete off and show it to you. Now, this is a particular uh, situation where the way you know oftentimes that you have lost pre-stress in pre-stressing tendons you know, due to corrosion or anything else is to try to move it. And if you can move it with your finger, you can pretty much guarantee that you've lost the pre-stress. Anybody who's ever grabbed or touched stressed tendons knows you can hardly move those. Uh, we have done external post-tensioning I'm thinking of a, a, a building up in San Francisco that we did. It had king posts coming down and there was a concern that, that tall cars might hit it. They weren't supposed to, there was a maximum height limit, but somebody came in with a tall car and a, and a big rack up on top of their car and smashed right into our post tensioning. And what it did was it ripped the top of that car off. Uh, our post tensioning didn't move and stressed Post-tensioning tendons are extremely strong, they're extremely rigid, and you can't move them. Even driving a car into it, you're probably not going to move it. So if you can move it with your fingers, and you can move it with a crowbar, you can move it with um, a screwdriver, separate any wires, you know you've lost pre-stress. So here was a particularly dramatic example. This was a, a job in Newport Beach we were called out to look at. By the way, in these pictures you will see paper. What, what you're seeing here is paper and that's the way back in the 70s post-tension concrete was, was protected and it was really not protected for corrosion. It was just protected to keep it from bonding to the concrete so it could be stressed and moved without also trying to move the concrete. So that's what they did in the 70s and sometimes into the early 80s. Greased tendons within paper, paper wrapped pre-stressing. Wasn't intended to be a long-term corrosion solution. And also you'll notice in this picture you can see, when you can see this type of aggregate, you're looking at lightweight concrete. Lightweight concrete, very popular in the 70s in combination with paper wrapped tendons. That turned out not to be a terrific system for long-term uh, corrosion protection. So, like I said, this is a dramatic case. Makes for great slides and presentations. What I was showing you was right above this car. This car is parked here. 
right through the moon uh, window, our, our sunscreen came crashing through the concrete. And to make it even more uh, dramatic, it fell right onto the child's car seat. Now, that's all it takes to get people very concerned about corrosion. And, uh, <laughs> you know, when everybody walked by this and saw it cordoned off with caution tape and could look inside, the residents got concerned. And sometimes that's what it takes to get something done. Here are other examples. Uh, this is what corroded pre-stressing will look like. You're called out to the job. You're looking for things like this. This is what to look for. This is an earlier stage of that. Uh, but the concrete starts talking to you. It's staining. It's not just a crack isn't a particularly big deal. But when you see a crack with brown uh, water and stains coming through, now you're probably talking about corrosion. A little bit farther along or you can go up with a hammer and start taking off some of that concrete oftentimes yourself this is what you will see and by the way this is not a pre-stressed concrete building this particular building was reinforced concrete and you're going to get the same thing sometimes worse uh, there, there was no even attempt to wrap or corrosion protect the rebar you know particularly built back in the 70s and early 80s those tension buildings will talk to you. They will, uh, if a tendon has been broken, a strand has been broken, they'll pop right out and stick their head out and say, hey, look at me. Um, I'm broken. Something's wrong. Come look at me. Come look at this building. Post tension tendons are obviously tensioned like elastic rubber bands. And when that's broken, out will come the grout pocket and out pokes out the uh, the gopher. So when you're walking around the building and you're trying to determine if you have a problem, look at all the slab edges. Walk every square foot of that building. Listen to the concrete. See what it's trying to tell you. A big mistakes that people make, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is looking at one thing and trying to extrapolate the entire situation. Tendons that break uh, will often loop out at, at the point where they have the least resistance. Now, what's interesting about this is the break in this particular tendon was about 100 feet away from this. So where the tendon decides to pop out and where it's broken, for whatever reason, uh, a plumber coring, uh, electrician trying to drill up into something, or corrosion, where it pops out and where you see the evidence isn't necessarily anywhere near where the problem occurred. This was interesting. I put this in more for fun because uh, we get called out and they say, well, this just happened. And we say, really? When did you repaint and restripe this deck? Oh, that was about five years ago. And so we say, you know, we, we're not thinking that this just happened. Tendons will pop out the bottom, they'll pop out the top. Really, wherever they have the least amount of concrete cover is where uh, that, that is no longer confined and the tendons will just pop out at that location. Again, probably unrelated by many feet to where it actually broke, though. We don't see this very often, but this was, this was a project, I want to say, up in the, in the San Francisco area. Not 100% sure. But we were called out, and, and this was a beam, and typically you won't see the tendons coming out the side of the beam. We usually see them coming out the top or the bottom of the slabs. But in this particular case, uh, they must not have used stirrups, or not many stirrups. And uh, the least path of resistance was right out the side for this tendon. Now, this is related. This was a project that we did in 2003 in San Francisco. This hotel has changed names. It's in the Fisherman's Wharf, Ghirardelli Square area. Uh, lightweight concrete, paper-wrapped tendons, and not 
entirely different than the Surfside structure. This was a this is a, a tower for the uh, hotel. This parking slab just went in and became the first level floor slab. There's another basement level underneath. So they had signs of corrosion. They had signs of corrosion in the rebar. There were signs of corrosion in the pre-stressing. We um, we used crowbars. We used everything we could to try to determine if how much pre-stress had been lost and how much we had to put back. But our biggest concern, and I hope everybody who's listening, if you take nothing else from this talk, is to be worried about the punching shear. Always be worried about the punching shear, particularly in flat plates, whether or not they're pre-stressed, whether or not they're just reinforced concrete. That should always be your primary concern. And that was in our case in 2003. Uh, we just were not comfortable, even though there had been no failure, even though it had been working. And by the way, those are terrible justifications for not doing anything, to just say that, well, for 30 years it's been there. Um, you know, I think, unfortunately, that you could see that in the Surfside structure. Just the logic that it hadn't failed didn't mean it wasn't going to. I mean, corrosion's a, a nasty thing. It will, it will really impair the concrete. It will obviously impair the, the reinforcement. So we got concerned that with enough loss of, of pre-stressing and reinforcement, bonded reinforcement, that there was going to be a punching shear problem, and we, we beefed that up. Um, flat plates, they may fail in flexure, but that's, a, that's kind of a slow and obvious failure. You can see it coming. We've seen slabs deflect three feet while they're failing, uh, but, and that's usually during construction, by the way, but they rarely come all the way down. The only way they are really going to come down and create a pancake-type collapse is to punch through the column. So that, I can't emphasize enough, that's your primary concern. Uh, this, these are photos that my dad and I took after Northridge. This was not a corrosion issue. This was an actual failure of the connection between the post-tension slab and the shear wall at one end of the building. But the damage is the same. It doesn't matter. If you're going to fail in punching shear due to corrosion, due to an earthquake, due to whatever, you can see what happens and you can see the domino effect that will happen in punching shear. Part of this building, about a third of it, went down, went all the way down, and really the post-tensioning actually saved it uh, about a third of the way in. The cars didn't do so well, but nobody, uh, nobody died in this, which is somewhat amazing. That's my father. He's, this, this was flat at this level at one point. This was a podium slab holding up three levels of wood. What you're seeing here is a column that has just simply punched through the deck. Again, that is the failure that you want to avoid. The flexural failure, the failure, whether or not this was a shear or flexural failure, it was a, a linear failure. It almost saved the building. So it's, uh, it's, I mean, it sounds a little strange, but you almost want to promote that because that saved the remainder of the building from continuing in the domino effect. But but this is what we need to avoid, the punching shear failure of these columns. So you're, you're evaluating the corrosion paper wrap PT systems. If you see cracks where you can see daylight from below, you have likely lost um, much or all of the post tension. If the through crack exists at a location of high bending, uh, it's not diagonal, it's not a restraint type crack, there's a good chance that you are looking at loss of compression due to loss of pre-stress. You've got to understand the crack patterns. The concrete will talk to you, but there are restraint, you have to understand the difference between restraint to shortening cracks, uh, shear cracks, flexural cracks, just simply uh, concrete shrinking cracks, a lot of different types of cracks, so you, you have to be a little bit of a concrete whisperer in these things. Here's one of the largest mistakes that are made by engineers. They decide 
it's a pre-stressed concrete building it's 40 years old it may have corrosion they're going to bring out a pre-stressing supplier and they're going to put a jack on and try to do a liftoff test to determine if there is pre-stressing in there that has proven to be a terrible way of determining loss of pre-stress the reason is a tendon can be completely broken 100 feet away but due to the the buildup of corrosion byproduct and the bonding of that because initially a corroded tendon and corroded rebar will actually grow in size the the byproduct grows initially on the metal so that creates even a greater bonding and friction so if you try to pull out that pre-stressing even if it's broken say 100 feet away you may read in the jack that you're getting a very high force and if you misconstrue that to mean that there is that much pre-stress in the system you're really not understanding what's happening so lift off tests when you think you have corrosion not a great idea you need to look at crowbars really it sounds unsophisticated but crowbars have been our best friend at determining whether or not there's pre-stress and tendons or not you can take a screwdriver to to the wires in between in a seven wire strand and if you can separate them there's no stress in there so like i said reading a liftoff test is not what it's telling you is is the bond strength not the pre-stress and the tendons so it's important when you get called out by by an owner on an older building you look at all of the forensic evidence everything walk top and bottom every square feet and all the perimeters look at what that concrete's trying to tell you distinguish between the cracks that might be normal shrinkage restraint cracks in pre-stressed concrete particularly ones in old buildings when when restraint to shortening wasn't as understood as it is today and just looking at a localized area and making a global determination can get you in trouble. So you've determined that you have a problem. You, you need to repair the concrete first. Your first step, remove all the loose concrete. And this is your, your speci specification to that, hopefully that design build contractor, concrete subcontractor. Clean and sandblast everything. You've got to stop the corrosion. You can replace, if it's possible to replace the pre-stressing, if it's possible to, to you know, route out and get more rebar in, you can try that. I don't know what that other bullet point was, but it couldn't have been that important. Patch the, la the large concrete spalls, uh, epoxy inject those cracks, and then stop the corrosion, stop the salt from getting in seal the top of the slab make sure that no de-icing salts are ever used again um, provide an elastomeric coating and a and a requirement that every five years it be evaluated and possibly redone monitor the system so this is what repaired cracks will end up looking like Sika makes some great products that will make that very stiff uh, very durable, very difficult for water to get into. So you've repaired the concrete. Now what about the reinforcement? Well, this is uh, a big part of this talk. If you can't get into the concrete and you can't, you know that you've lost strength due to corrosion of the reinforcement, whether or not be a, you know, the, just the post tensioning, the rebar or a combination of both uh, you may want to look at external post tensioning putting in replacing some of that strength from below there's particular advantages particularly when you've got some headroom to work with if this this was an actual I think four and a half or four and three quarters inch lightweight slab so by the time you had the one inch cover that you're supposed to have top and bottom or three quarter inch cover back at the time you had very little drape so you weren't getting much balance load you weren't getting much d depth for moment strength 
you can get both of those pretty easily. A lot of upward balance load and really good strength D, distance between the compression and the tension when you come in below. So you need less. It's more efficient. I mean, it is really efficient to come in below the system, use a greater drape for strengthening. Very important, you, as you're doing these things, you don't want to make the system worse. I mean, you don't want to create problems trying to fix it. So we locate the existing reinforcing with x-rays. And by the way, they're not nearly as expensive as people want to tell you that they are. Not very difficult to do. You just don't want to be standing anywhere near it because there's those x-rays themselves, I guess, are not, not too healthy. Once you've found the post-tensioning and you know you're not going to hit it, then you can start coring into the system. We will core right through columns and you've got to be careful on this because uh, you apply external post-tensioning to a column, you are relying on the shear friction of those dowels connecting up into the slab and you don't want to sever those. That's, that's what's going to keep the column vertical and not sliding horizontally when you apply a large force to the side of it. So try to locate, try to know where the column verticals are and try to, if you're going to core through it, make sure you don't hit those. We use king posts. Some people call these diverters. They create the, the drape. Uh, they, these create the point loads for uh, the equivalent loads. This was a job out in, uh, out in Palm Springs. We got a lot of D out of this. We had uh, great headroom, which is what you're really looking for when you're doing these things. And um, notice everything is galvanized. The tendons are galvanized. King posts are all galvanized. We stressed the tendons and I asked the guy to turn the jack toward me so I could get a good shot of this and he, he did. Notice that the anchors, everything is galvanized. The tendon itself is galvanized. Button head's galvanized. The plate is galvanized. Again, you don't want to use a system that's going to corrode to try to fix a corroding system. Now, I apologize. This is, I think, 2012, probably the very early days of, Go! of the iPhone video. But, but this was us stressing. You can see the slack being taken out. And then you can see literally the stretch of the tendon as it's happening. Now, what you don't notice is that this slab is slightly lifting up off of those shores. Those shores became very loose and very easy to get out <laughs> after we externally post-tensioned. They were tight before, and now they're not. Go! Oops. Again, I apologize for the quality of this video, but this is back, I, I believe, Actually, I believe we're talking about 2005 back here. I don't even know if this was an iPhone, but again, I asked the, the guy to turn the jack towards me, which he probably didn't appreciate that much, but I wanted to see the show everything happening. And it was very nice to avoid. This is the stressing of the tendons. Initially, the drape, the sag is just taken out. Then we are actually stretching the tendon with the hydraulic tip. That's how the force gets in the tendon. That's how the balance loads get applied to the concrete. And that's how the strength is applied. Sometimes uh, we have difficulty in knowing or finding a good place to stress. So we have to get creative. I don't think any two jobs we've ever strengthened were, were even close to the same. We always had to do something different on each one. This particular one was up in the mountains. Uh, we were subterranean by multiple levels and, and had to, we couldn't stress out the side of the building. These were big retaining walls in the dirt. So came up with an internal stressing where we stress a tendon here, stress a tendon here, go to the other side, stress a tendon, stress a tendon, just a little bit and keep coming back and keep going around until we got all the force into the system. That's what it looked like before we cut off the tendons, the tails. 
this particular one this was that same project we actually applied a new post tension concrete deck up above that deck we designed under its own weight and dead loads to span actually lift up we overbalanced the system so that it wasn't loading this corroding slab so up above the slabs arching up a little bit and it actually did happen we could watch it happen beam to beam now of course when you put cars on and lots of snow additional loading there's a good chance it's going to come back down and make contact so we had strengthened this failing slab we had waterproofed over it hopefully we had kept any additional corrosion from happening then we put the new post tension concrete 5000 type 5 uh, 0.4 water cement ratio deck on top and, and post tensioned that with encapsulated tendons. So this took a little bit of everything. We actually had, actually had to seismically upgrade this also. But the interesting thing here was um, finding a very good qualified coring person who could core concrete at an angle that had four tendons coming through. That's not easy to do. The coring machine wants to be placed on perpendicular to whatever it's coring and to find somebody who can who can core at an angle is uh, that's a skill that's a skill and it worked great I think those are two inch thick plates uh, we had a lot of force going in there that new deck was reacting onto the existing beams which were strengthened which was reacting onto the existing girder and it needed a lot of help this has been there since I think 2004 or 5 and it's been doing great. The one way slabs, probably the easiest thing to do, I'll be honest with you. Um, and it looks nice. Two way slabs, a little more complex because you've got to get the load usually from the, you know, the center of the bay to the columns. And that can either be done diagonally or orthogonally. But uh, one way or the other, you're, you're getting load out from the middle of the bay and trying, you know, of course, always getting it where it needs to go to the support. That can create technically and, and physically challenging ways of stressing, coring, anchoring. Notice one thing you'll see <laughs> from us a lot is we're always trying to strengthen the punching shear. I, that that to me after seeing that Northridge failure with my father in 1994 that's never left me I'm terrified of punching shear failures and every time we get in on any of these we if we can we will strengthen the punching shear too this was one my father did uh, in Anaheim this is a mind bender uh, orthogonally to get the load to the columns but trying to pick up the load out in the middle of the bay ran a truss system down the middle of the bays now this like you said you got to follow the load path in your mind and these are these are fun this load is going up reacting up and strengthening and literally lifting i think uh, three to four inches up on this deck up so that tendon is coming down and now actually reacting down. That tendon group is pushing down. Now this tendon group is pushing up with just a little more force than it's pushing down. <laughs> um, so anyway, these are, these are fun mind games to walk around and try to determine where, where the load path is going, where the load is how it's getting to the columns. But instead of doing a diagonal method, uh, my father and his partner decided to do an orthogonal method, which very creative, um, fun to follow. This is another one my father did. I uh, believe this is downtown Los Angeles. Multi-story building that had been cored so badly that nobody, uh, I think, had any confidence that the upper decks had the required strength. So they externally post tensioned and ran steel columns up floor to floor, but didn't have enough headroom in those floors to do external post tensioning. 
but they had plenty in the first level lobby. So all of the post-tensioning for, I believe, all 12, 13, 14 decks were done at one level in a tremendous amount of force with a tremendous amount of uplift. And it obviously has been working for quite some time. Another thing, you know, I'm always selling here, but uh, external post-tensioning, if you're doing a different type of strengthening system, most of the time you have to remove all the systems in the building, the HVAC system, plumbing, uh, everything's got to get out of the way, then, which totally shuts down the building. It can't be used. All the water, the electricity, gone. Uh, gets strengthened, and then gets that gets put back in. We have been successful at just simply adding the external plus tensioning and threading through the existing systems that are there. So another, another benefit, can't say you can always do that, but... Uh, we have been able to stop short of, of taking the building apart down to its structural frame before having to strengthen. I told you you're going to see some wood. I wouldn't, <laughs> personally, I'm getting too old. I wouldn't do this again. But we strengthened a wood panelized, you know, glue lamp beam panelized roof system for a, a cooler, if I recall, somewhere in the 12,000, 15,000 pound range and strengthened those glue lamb beams to accept it, um, built a, a, a frame up on top. But the, uh, we remember that when they stress these, the beams creaked so much going back up that, that people ran out of the building. They were absolutely sure it was failing. They'd never heard sounds like that, and they knew that if they did, they needed to get out fast. It was really just the beams lifting up. Uh, you know, we were we were jacking those beams up to accept the future load. So balancing load, but it made a lot of sound in a wood building, which scared the heck out of everybody. And so I'm not sure. I, I was young at the time, and we must have needed some money. But we had large drapes too. We we got some pretty serious force up into that. Very important. Uh, Engineers get confused, I'll be honest with you, I, you know, I can understand this, but if you're a post-tensioning designer and you're used to designing to new buildings, the first thing you're worried about is stress checks in the concrete. There is no reason whatsoever to be concerned about stress checks in 40-year-old buildings that have cracked up severely already. You just ignore that part of the code, and that is not a difficult thing to convince an owner, peer reviewer, building department, that there's absolutely no point in the stress limits of the current code. So what we're doing with external post-tensioning is providing strength. We have lost strength and we are, we're getting it back and we are helping the deflections too. We can pick up some deflections, we can add some strength. You know, the, the current building code is very good, of course, with new construction, retrofits, also, they're, they're very good. They're strengthening existing structures, evaluating existing structures. However, um, I'm sorry, not strengthening, but, but adding to, you know, uh, taking a 30-year-old building and adding a vertical or lateral extension to it. You, you can follow the code and they've got good input. Very little input in any code or anywhere about strengthening. Just providing lost strength back. So it's really, that's kind of a good thing. That's turned out to be a good thing for us because it, it boils down to logic and reason. And uh, once you can get there, most of us engineers can do pretty well. We, we sit down with an owner, with a, you know, get a contractor involved, but we sit down with the building department and say, look, most of the time these are voluntary strengthening. The, the owners themselves or maintenance people found the problem we are voluntarily convincing the owners to fix it. There is no code uh, trigger, really, unless the building's just determined to be absolutely dangerous that says you have to do this. So most of the time, these are voluntary things. And I, that probably applies to that Surfside building in, in Florida also. That's a good thing, because what that means is when you're working with the building department, 
there are going to be things you can meet uh, for the, the current building code, and there are going to be things you can't. You know, Fire-related things. Uh, you know, sometimes they're going to want uh, ADA upgrades, and they'll always try to get what they can get. But, but realistically, you're doing the best you can. You've convinced the owner to spend some money, but not silly money. And the building departments really with us have always been very open to saying, well, we understand you can't satisfy every part of what a new building would, but we're significantly improving the situation over what we have now. Therefore, sometimes, you know, we're kind of dancing around some of the fire issues that, that we would otherwise have to deal with. And that's been, to be honest with you, one of the, the largest issues. Um, Something to be careful about. So when you're you're actually doing a design, so you, you kind of scrapped the strength or the uh, allowable stress requirements, and you're focusing only on strength. Statics, code, reality understands that there are secondary effects that happen. Um, some people call them hyperstatic, and I can't stand that phrase. That doesn't exist in the code. There is no definition of it. The code recognizes the term secondary effects, and those are reactions created, restraint reactions at supports due to the fact that you have pre-stressed the building. So the, the, the supports are restraining what, what the slab or the beam or the girder would otherwise want to do and how it would want to deflect, and it's holding it down, really. So you've got effects. You've got secondary effects. And you need to account for those when you're doing external post-tensioning also. And the code says use a 1.0 factor of uh, load factor on that. Um, notice that from your pre-stressed concrete class, if you took mine, you remember that you get the final uh, pre-stressing stresses by applying the external post-tensioning balance loads, the equivalent loads on the system. To find the secondary effects, you subtract out the primary pre-stressing moment. The primary pre-stressing moment was F times E, if you recall. So the difference between the final pre-stressing moments and the uh, primary pre-stressing moments is the secondary effects. Now, notice that F times E is a very significant thing in external post-tensioning. E, the difference, the distance between the centroid of the pre-stressing and the centroid of the concrete section is more substantial. So you can't ignore this. You've got to understand the fundamentals of pre-stressing. Use proper software. Use software that can account for this, can, can account for pre-stressing being outside of the concrete, for one. But that's important. You, you do not want to go about this ignoring uh, a major part of post-tensioning post strength design. So protection, how do we protect it? ACI, the 319 code, uh, says they shall be protected for corrosion. That kind of goes without saying. <laughs> that one's a more obvious one. The next one is, is a little bit more interesting and you have to read into it. Commentary section um, 20.5.6, corrosion protection methods should meet the fire protection requirements of the general building code, okay, unless the installation of external post-tensioning is to only improve serviceability. What that's saying is if you are arguing, can make the argument that the post-tensioning is not for strength, but you're improving serviceability. You are, you are, uh, getting back deflection, you're recovering deflections, you, um, one way or the other, and this is where it gets dicey, you're always going to be adding strength. It's, it's impossible to recover the deflections and not be adding strength at the same time. So what this argument really boils down to is whether or not this building needs the external post-tensioning in order to be safe. And that's the delicate argument that, that gets made. And if you can get comfortable yourself and get the building department comfortable, 
you can do some of this external post tensioning without adding fireproofing. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is the fireproofing application can often be more expensive, more time consuming, and many times is the difference between the project voluntarily going forward and not going forward. So it's one of those delicate things. If you are voluntarily strengthening or fixing this building and you think you can make the argument that it's primarily for serviceability that you're doing it, you can make that argument and not apply fireproofing. Um, you can save a lot of money. Now, whether or not you're comfortable with that is another thing, and you would have to get yourself comfortable with that. You can never get around protecting for corrosion, so that's always required. Galvanize everything, corrosion protect everything. We belt and suspenders the whole thing. We have galvanized tendons, then we use the thick grease, then we use actually a little thicker uh, plastic, and we encapsulate. We seal it up at the ends, so really no water can get in, nothing can get in. And even if it did, we have galvanized tendons. So galvanized anchors, galvanized caps, galvanized plates. Uh, we painted these king posts for uh, protection. But what's interesting, and the reason I bring this slab in, this slide in, is that um, this was the city of Newport Beach, and we had to make one of those difficult decisions with them. This was a voluntary upgrade. We were strengthening, recovering some deflections. But we, uh, we came to the uh, agreement that instead of applying fireproofing to every one of these king posts and tendons for their full length, that we would put in a, a sprinkler system instead. And the building department went for that. They liked that. You know, these older buildings don't have sprinkler systems typically. So that was kind of a horse trading thing that we did. It was much less expensive. If I recall back in the day, that was about $1.25 a square foot to put in a sprinkler system, substantially less than the hundreds and thousands of dollars it was going to take to fireproof all these. And it's been there for, I think this was about 2005. So another argument, I mean, th these are just, I'm getting into the weeds, but a car having a fire is a very localized fire. It's not going to spread laterally. They don't. I've seen a lot of car fires. They're going to burn what's directly above them, and there's a limited amount of fuel based upon literally the fuel in the car. So it won't burn forever. There's a limited amount of fuel it has to get hot, and it's localized. So you may lose something directly above it, but the likelihood of, of wiping out the whole system in a fire is pretty small if, if not totally negligible. So a lot of arguments get made. You're going to have to get comfortable with your particular situation. When we do have to fireproof, this is what it looks like. This was a very nice, pretty looking fireproof system. This was an ugly one. <laughs> uh, both satisfied the code. You know, we use the uh, bottom cord member of truss requirements in the fireproofing with the lath and the plaster. You know, the thickness of the plaster determines the hours of fire rating that you get. So that's how that is done. And I want to end up closing here with something that I feel fairly strongly about. We, um, you, know, you get to the end of one of these strengthening things and there'll be people, the peer reviewers, that are uncomfortable, maybe building department may not be comfortable, the owner may not be comfortable, maybe you're not comfortable. You've done your best. The likelihood of having really good drawings to work off of is small. Maybe you have drawings, maybe not. You know, these buildings tended to be done with 12 pages of drawings, and, and they, they worked well. But you're, you're believing that everything got constructed the way it was shown, and you, you just there's enough uh, doubt in there that you may want to load test when you're done. Now, ACI 318.19, section 27.5, everybody, every engineer who does concrete should know this. Um, whether or not you're doing strengthening or external post-tensioning or whatever you're doing, know that there is a monotonic, monotonic load test procedure. And this basically says, we don't care if it was all built wrong, we don't care if the whole thing was built upside down, we don't care if you left out half of 
what was required on the drawings. If it passes a load test, you're done. You are done. You satisfy the strength and deflection requirements of the code. This is incredibly valuable because it puts all doubt to rest. Um, and if, if you want all doubt to be put to rest, load test costs in the range of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, depending on the area that you're looking at. And you can pick a, a sample area, or you can do the whole thing. This is decisions you have to make. But if you if the structure passes a load test after you have strengthened it, you sleep well at night because you've proven that you did your job. So something I strongly recommend. So if anybody has any questions, you can always email those to me. Uh, I'm not too great about looking at the YouTube questions that stack up, but if you, um, if you want to send them to me, I am happy. Uh, Dirk at SenecaStructural.com for those of you who don't know, and I will do my best to get back to you. All right. Thank you.